everyone. This is Paul Casey with the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series. I'm very excited that this is one of the other discussions that we have here on the Hall of Fame. Generally, we talk to our special Hall of Fame members, but we've gone in a different directions lately. One is called The Art of War, Kempo Style. And today is the second part of The Art of Forms, Kempo Style. So we will be discussing uh, American Kempo forms. We'll set some perimeters on it. We'll look at the basis of it. We'll discuss it. Uh, it is an open forum. So uh, my questions will be related to all the guests. And uh, we want to hear what you have to say. So with no further ado, let's go forward and welcome our members with Richard Planis. Hello, Hawk. It's good to have you here, sir. Good to be here, Paul. Armin, it's nice to see you, sir. Not a member, just uh, on the Q side of the Q&A. It's all right. We always, this is an open forum for all our members. Uh, Liam, it's good to hey, see Mark. you all the way out here. Mr. Chuck Sullivan. Hey. Hello, sir. Always glad to see you and your smiling voice as you go. <laughs> <laughs> Zachary Carter, looking very dapper. Are you awake? Barely. Okay. <laughs> ah, the Golden Dragon, Dennis Knatzer. Looking dapper with his patch. I can see that. Jason Farnsworth. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you. Robert Ashmore. Hello. Yes, sir. Good enough. Sean, uh, Shane Price. Hello, Shane. He's back for more. <laughs> nice to see Senior Master of the Arts, Mr. Bob White. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate you being here. And last but not least. It's good being here. Uh, Master of the Arts, Mr. Todd Durgan. So, uh, hello. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Todd, how you doing, buddy? Yes, sir. Doing Are good, you ready you. today? Good to see you, gentlemen. Good, good. So let's talk about it. So uh, let's go into the forms. We actually talked a little bit of the basis uh, last time we met. And so I'm going to ask for some definition on it. Mr. White, what do you expect to see when – in a student when they're either training or practicing a Kempo form? Well, we practice three levels. You have to memorize, visualize, and actualize. So it depends on the educational experience, the time and grade. But every time you do a form, you're telling a story. And I think more congruent that the student is while he executes, the better story he tells. So I think forms are an excellent vehicle to be able to get a student to express himself and kind of explain and show uh, what his interpretation of the art is. Oh, do you have a, a standard or continuity that you try to have all your instructors use as a base for your teachings? Yeah, we do. Just as I mentioned, we, we know how critical it is that they have to memorize the movement. Then they have to know, where the attacks are coming from and what they're coming at them with. And then I want them to do it like it's a real self-defense situation. And I think if they implement and get those three stages and our instructors are able to convey that message as uh, kind of an SOP, that's what we do in our school, then I see the quality of their performance improve. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, what are the criteria that you use in teaching a form? Well, um, criteria. Uh, uh, first of all, you have the moves. You, you know what they are. You know what the, uh, what the techniques are. Ultimately, what I want to see, uh, of course, ours is the master form is 55 techniques done in a string, in a row, at all these various angles. And what I tell my people is, this is a 58-man attack. And what's difficult for a lot of people, of course, when there's nobody there, is to visualize an attacker. When I see, when I, I have nobody in front of me, but I can see that arm coming at me. I can see how I've got to block it. I can see where his head is at. I can see where his groin is at. I know exactly where the targets are. And if I don't hit one, I get real upset with myself. And that's exactly what I want them to do. I want them to be able to hit the targets, <coughs> right on target. And, uh, and, and get this full motion. And of course you have to do it in such a way that you don't burn yourself out because 
55 techniques in a row, I counted up the, uh, the number of elements, and it's 236 elements in that form. An element meaning sometimes it might be a check and grab and a punch. I don't count that as three, I count that as one. So that's an element. So there are 236 elements in that form. And it is so easy, so easy to get off target if you're not, if you're not concentrating. And I would like for them to be able to show me and show, say you're in an auditorium of 5,000 spectators. I want the guy in the top row to be able to see every move that that, that, that form represents on the floor. Uh, Jason Farnsworth, Jason, what yes, do you sir. expect your instructor to teach you when you're learning forms? Uh, the same, the same as everybody else has been talking about, visualizing the attacker in front of you, covering each move one by one, small segments of the form, uh, piece by piece, uh, add to it as, uh, as you keep moving through the form itself. But uh, um, the hows and whys are important, to, very important as well to actually understanding the form when you go through it. Armin, your training, your teacher's going to come in, your instructor's going to teach you a form. Uh, what, uh, what do you expect to learn when you're being taught those forms? I re I'm more interested in the whys. The why? why are we, okay. Why are we doing what we're doing? Well, how does it tie into uh, the system? And uh, basically to keep it to that. I want to, I want to understand the application of the concepts and principles in that form. And if I understand that, I think I've gotten something from that session. Todd Durgan, the basis of your teaching, what is the most important facets of teaching forms for you? Uh, connecting the basics of the art in, in general with regards to, you know, basic stances, positions, angles, all of those things into a more of a continuity of dance coupled with power and timing so i mean you know there's a there's a gamut but i like mr white's uh uh analogy or his step ladder approach where you have you know uh memorization i forget what they were sorry mr white then the last actualization, one actualization visualization yeah that's very good uh, you know the, yeah that's great so, I mean, ultimately you want to get there, but, um, you know, but I like to focus on the basics. This, the, it doesn't matter what they do. If their basics suck and their stances suck, it's all going to suck anyway. So. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, Mr. Planis, I'm trying to set the stage for you. So let's tell you how. So, Huck, how do we not suck? Have a good instructor. Uh, qualified instructors have been the problem with every system, not just Kenpo, uh, since the old man died and really long before that. Uh, but, you know, the, I remember I saw a clip one time on uh, the internet about the old man, that's Mr. Parker, as you know, talking about why we do the forms and the techniques. He says they don't have to be done exactly the way they're done. They're just teaching you how to move. So you've moved in every possible way and position that you can do and you learn all your rules and principles of motion and that's what the forms are laid out on like the ones and twos or your basics forms. They teach you just your basics. Then the three up is your technique forms, three is grabs, four is kicks and punches, five is takedown, six is weapons and they're all in categorized motion and categorized order. But there's a lot of things in the forms that are done wrong. If people analyze the form to see more wrong than right, as we say a lot of times. You'll notice that the, the technique in the form is nowhere near a lot of time what the, the technique is written and what it, it teaches you. The, uh, at the, take the first move in five, the takedown form. That is done totally offline and totally different than the way the technique is done, and a lot of people don't realize that. And the forms, the move in the form represents more than one thing. That's why it's done that way. So if I was doing it for this, I would have to do this and change it to this. If I was doing it for that, I would have to change it for that. Uh, but the thing is, you're learning your rules and principles of motion, your power principles, you know, torque, backup, mass, marriage, gravity, and body mechanics. Power comes from body mechanics. And a lot of people 
suck, as you say, at their body mechanics. You know, they don't have any body mechanics. They don't, they can tell you what the, the, the definition of torque back at mass emerges gravity is, but when they get on the floor and do it, it doesn't show in their motion. So what I, what I call that is just words to them, it's just memorized words. You know, uh, there's a lot more to say about it, but that's it in a nutshell. You know, it's funny, today I was spending some quality time with my son, teaching him how to print, print letters and numbers. And I remember many times hearing Mr. Parker use that, the alphabet of motion, how we would print our letters, then become cursive, then we personalize it. Is there a problem, because Mr. Parker said, and you, I'm quoting you right now, uh, where he says, you don't have to do it exactly, I might be off a little bit on that, you're personalizing it. Is that what is happening to Campbell Forms? Too much personalization? Well, I think what... I was going to go yeah. with... Plan, uh, let's go with Huck first, and then I'll pass that around, only because he brought that up first. They've been personalized a lot uh, for competition. Some things have been changed, and we were talking about this a little bit the other day, uh, just me and you, how people have changed the forms and the technique, the way they're doing it, and it will not work. It just will not work. Your teeth will be gone. They'll fly. Uh, there's a lot of things like that. Uh, you know, it, the saying is that Kempo form, the definition, or one, you can call it definition, of Kempo, of Kempo forms is Kempo forms do not represent a fight. They teach you the rules and principles of motion and that everything has a reverse and an opposite and gives you an example. An example, not every example. An example to get the ball rolling for you to find out where the rest of them are. We get introduced to everything we do in the forms. Everything we do. I ask people, you know, a lot of times, just, I'm not going to use it as a teaching thing, but just to make people think. I said, and I, I've done it many times. I said, there's one move in long one that's not a punch. One strike that's not a punch. What is it? And people have to go back and start to form over and do it and do it. And say, who, who, who can tell me what it is? Mr. Connect, what's the answer? Huh? What? I asked Dan, Esther, what's the answer? What did he say? One move's not a punch? Can I say it? One strike. One strike. That's can I punch. say it? Rear no. elbow. Sorry. <laughs> Give it to him first. You can him. In a second. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's the transitional rear elbow after the vertical outward, yeah. That's right. Where do we Most get it from? Kind of, but then why? Why is that there? Who, what, when, where, and why? Is the rules of reporting. That's to make me, 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 me. Every, like in the definition, everything has a reverse and an opposite. Going this way, it's a punch. Going this way, it's an elbow. That's your introduction to reverse motion. That's your first reverse move. And again, we get introduced to everything we do in the form. Your orbital switches, you know, half circle, circle, straight lines, cut and, you know, stay on a circle, reverse circle, cut the circle in half. It's just a study of motion. That's what we call Kenpo, it's a study of motion based on rules and principles. And they're shown to you in the forms and you should see them. Just like the isolations in the form. All forms don't have isolations, but a lot of them do. There's isolations in one, isolations in, in three. When the second, second horse, a two horse form, long three, you get in the back and you do your hand isolation. Well, what are you doing? You're cutting circles in half. You're showing half circles, vertical and horizontal, and then you start using them. And if you look at all the techniques after that, you're doing that. You're cutting your circles in half, vertical and horizontal, and your duels and singles, forwards and backwards, all the things that go with category completion and uh, rules of motion on the form. I like, I'll just go back. You know, when you said that's the, the elbow, the, the elbow upward, that's the first reverse motion. I. I would disagree with that. I would say during your salutation on the very first move, when you salutation do the first down, is not part of the form. No, 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 no. But on the, no, no. But on, right after that, on the first inward block, when your left hand goes back to rechamber, that's a reverse motion there as well. Oh no, no. There's people going around teaching the hidden breaks in in short one. You know what I'm talking about. That's BS, and you know it. All they want to think about is the four basic blocks, inward, outward, upward, downward, one hand at a time, one block, and the other hand goes chambered at your waist to make you forget about it. That's not a secret back elbow or anything else. What it is pointed out in long one where yes, now it is an elbow, but that's the first one. 
But the first blatant ones you're saying, basically. Yeah, to stand out. People right. call it stand out, yeah. Okay. Joe Rabello. Hello. The comment. I'm coming back to you now. <laughs> well, I mean, when we look at when we look at the forms, we look at long one, and we talk about that exact back elbow, and people say, "Well, that that's original." I go, "No, it's not. It's, it comes from from, you know, like if we look at Hungar Kung Fu, Taming the Tiger, and whatnot. That was the stuff that Jimmy Wing Wu helped to formulate form, and it's it's that overt action that we pay our homage to. And I'm really glad to be here because if it weren't for that man, Richard Huck Planis, where would I be learning the forms? I mean, this this is the insights that you know we we need to get and we need to keep. But as far as personalizing forms, you know, sometimes people have to personalize forms because they, they don't have a choice. Um, I've got a woman right now, she's in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy. There's just certain moves and certain forms she physically can't do. You know, I mean, I remember we're talking to Ishinru guys, they talk about Shimbuku and his roundhouse kick. He had a bad leg, he had a bum leg in his later years, he couldn't throw the roundhouse kick the way he used to anymore. You know, I know right now between my knee and my hernia and my, my you know, different injuries that I have, I can't always do everything the way that I, I want to. So I think there's a difference between personalizing for the sake of personalizing and then personalizing because we're all getting older and our bodies don't work the same way anymore. And you I think we really same, need to though. differentiate that. Say again? I said, you still sound the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm loud and obnoxious. I understand. I love you, man. Okay, let's go. Let's move around here a little bit. Zach Carter. Yes, sir. How you doing? Why don't you ask a question to uh, one of our panel? Well, I was wanting to comment on that because uh, my lineage is uh, from Mr. Trejo, as everybody knows, and Mr. Casey. And one of the things Mr. Trejo was known for was his personalization of uh, Form 4. And uh, those little nuances. Now, I remember years ago going over that form with him. Of course, he taught the basic traditional way, but then he also taught the Trejo way and as those points. And is that a bad thing or a good thing? Because I'm proud of that because I, I think that's a part of our lineage. And to be honest with you, not many people do that form with those elements in there. And you know them when you see them if you've seen Mr. Trejo uh, do four back in the day. So what's, what's the opinions on that? Well, let's ask, let's go right over here and talk to uh, Leon, sir. Yes. What is your thoughts on, on what you've heard so far? And do you, do you keep your forms traditional? Do you personalize it? How do you address it? I, I love farms, uh, farms really, uh, I think in, in my camp of farms is what I'm best at. And I try to keep it traditional. I do accept that the certain parts of the farm um, um, won't work. Um, so when I get to that stage, if I'm teaching a student and I know this part of this farm is not going to work, I will say to the student, this is traditional. I'm going to try to keep it as close as possible to tra traditional campo. But if I've done this for real, this is what I do. So when I hit a stage in a farm that I feel is not going to work on the street, I also show the student the street version of the farm, of that particular technique. Question, so, Huck. The forms, did you have any part in how they were created, developed, or evolved? No, no, the forms were long done before I ever started, no. But, Did you uh, ever question was, them? Because you obviously are a thinker. You know, oh, the, you can uh, tell the yeah, problems yes, that we I, have. <laughs> I question them a lot. Uh, we were from a different line, and I tell a lot of people that I was just telling somebody the other day. Uh, when I got to Parker, we didn't have form six, but we had five. and. Uh, we never could figure out what the first move was for. So the old man asked me, he says, okay, what do you got? I says, I got through five, he said, let me see it. So he did the first move, he said, wait a minute, well, what are you doing? I said, five, he says, not like that, you're going the wrong way. I says, what? He said, you're going the wrong way. He showed me what to do. I said, oh, no wonder we couldn't figure out what it was for. You know, we're doing this meaningless motion, you know, going the wrong, instead of going, you know, to the first move and then sweeping to the right, we go to the left and never could figure out what it was for because it was just that just motion, you know, just like a lot of people, monkey see, monkey do, with no understanding of why and how come. You know, you know many times I would listen to him speak either in Pasadena or at seminars, and he would always bring up questions for the uh, participants. And 
uh, the sad thing, and probably you have this, both you, Mr. Planis, you, Mr. Knasser, you, Mr. White, you get a group of black belts in front of you. They're too intimidated to ask you a question, one, because they don't know the, the answer. Two, they think they're going to say the wrong answer. Or three, they may be arrogant to think they're going to ask you a question you may not know the answer. And I always thought that was very funny because uh, Parker never dodged a question. My question for you is, in when it came to form, uh, Mr. Sullivan, you were creating the staff set. Can you explain that to us, how that came to be? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Parker uh, taught me the staff set, a staff set. And it was so repetitive. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always looking to condense things as much as possible. Let's look at the essence of everything in it. So I figure instead of doing, uh, just as an example, um, a straight punch a hundred times, if you do it three or four times and then practice it a hundred times, you get the same effect. Except when, when you're doing it in a form, they get so complex and the moves get so complex and the, the combinations. So what I did was I learned that set, set and then I was going to have to teach it. He, he let me know that that was going to be kind of my job. And, um, I just, I dreaded teaching that form the way he taught it to me. So I took that form, the essence of it, got everything in the form, except I cut out all the repetition. And and I, one night, he and I used to work out after the class was over. And um, I said, I have something to show you. <laughs> he, he said, what is it? And I showed it to him. And um, after I finished, and he expected it to be a lot longer, of course. But when I finished, um, to my relief, he looked at me and he says, you know what? He says, that's what we'll teach. He says, forget that other thing. That was, so that's the history of the staff set as we do it today. As it's How long today. did it take you to, to come up with that? Uh, about, uh, about, about a whole weekend. A week? I took what I had and, um, and I, you know, I, like I said, I started just, Take out the repetition. Uh, it don't have to do it four directions. You just do it one direction, and unless, of course, it ha it has to be done that way. And that, that certain times you have to do it in various directions. But in this particular case, we really didn't have to. So uh, anyway, he liked it, and um, and that, so that's what we uh, that's what we wound up doing. I, I he obviously can liked answer. It. Dennis can answer question. How are the forms defined, and how do they categorize? And then I'm going to ask Mr. Planis to, to expand on that. Well, as Mr. Mr. Parker would say, you know, the, the first four forms, short one, long one, short two, and long two are the dictionaries to the system. Short three and beyond are the encyclopedias, and the sets are the appendices. And that was the definition of the category. Okay. Mr. Planis, did he actually explain that to you that way as well? Uh... Well, I really didn't even understand that, but you know, I, I said what it is. Why don't you elaborate then, Dennis? So he understands. Are your basics forms, you know, they teach you the rules and principles of motion. You know, you start off, okay, and it's all categorized and, and in chronological order. What is short one? Retreating with a front hand block. That's period, just retreating with a front hand block. Then you go along, with, then, and the order is always in, out, up, down, in, out, up, down, in, out, up, down. For that reason, that's how you analyze it when you look. So then you go long one, okay? Now, first of all, I call short one the foundation of the system that uh, rule number one, establish a base. If you can't get in a good fighting stance and establish a base and block because we're doing self-defense and not self-offense, you, you base and block. If you can't do that, you'll never be able to do a technique. You'll be too busy looking for your teeth or trying to get up off the floor if he lets you. Okay, so, you know, that's the importance of it. Okay, now, base and block doesn't win a fight. I got a counter, so let's counter. And we'll start off with a forward roll, learning a new stance and the reaching, bracing angles and everything. And we know that it gives us, we learn in our basic class. Okay, but we, we counter with a straight punch, the least used punch in tempo. If you look through all the techniques, you'll find the straight punch very few. But the, all the punches are in there. You got the upper cut, the diagonal, the vertical, and the straight. And it goes without saying what the rest of it is. So then, all right, I block with the front hand, counter with the rear hand. So I go to two. Well, in, out, up, down again. Oh, now, first of all, the second half 
of along. I tell people back, back in the 60s, we never made people learn both sides of the form because it's sort of built in. Uh, a short form is one-sided, the long form is two-sided. So when you do short one, you get one side only, then you go uh, long one, the first half with a the punch, then the second half is the left side of short one, but you're doing something different. So you're going in, out, up, up down again, but you say, okay, what haven't I done before? I blocked with the front hand, I counted with the rear hand. How about let's block with the rear hand? We haven't done that yet. So let's block with the rear hand and learn the stance that comes in with upper body or trunk rotation that just turns the upper body forward like a forward bow, but leaves your base neutral. And the reason for that is when you're punching, you need the reach and you're the one doing the hitting. When he's punching you, reach is his problem. So you don't need the reach, but you need the alignment. So if you don't turn your body, you won't cover your face with the block. So you learn that mechanic. And that just goes to in, out, up, down again with that. Then you go to two, all right, in, out, up, down again. What haven't we done before? Well, let's block with the front hand and counter with the front hand. And then we go in, and there's so much to learn, we start piling it on. <clears throat> so second move, outward with the punch, the same thing you did in long one, but you put them together. And we'll ask people all the time, says, why did you put them together? Uh, sure you can. No, that's not why. You changed the power principle. You went from torque, when you step away, you usually base and pivot and use torque as your power principle. But when you step in, you use backup mass. So the pin step and cock principle is not used. The pin step and strike principle is used. So you don't waste your backup mass. And then you keep going that, keep going on that. You know, that's torque and backup mass. And the next move is torque and marriage with gravity, which is the upward, but it's not used for power. If it's upward, does not use the power principle. Upward is the only block based on angle of deflection, so it doesn't need a power principle. It's a roof over the house, it does deflection, so that's why we use that. The torque is used to put the block in and line it up only, but the marriage with gravity is used for the middle knuckle, and that's used. So sometimes we use the power principles like torque for alignment and sometimes for power, and that's shown all through the forms a little higher up. And then we go again through in, out, up, down, but we realize, uh, we just you wind it on this, but when we hit 7.30, we're still not finished with the form, but you finished in, out, up, down. So I tell people, every little move, every little microscopic move you do from 7.30 is brand new, you have never done before, and you need to analyze that on your own to come up with that. Different striking principle, different, you know, first send it outward, first check, first snapping half fist, first forward bow transitional, you know, a transitional forward bow instead of a stance. I mean, you're just piling it on, adding more and more information as you go. And then long two is just a combination of short one, I mean, long one and short two. If you take a look at that, the first two moves of the form are the inward and the chop, that's short two. Then the forward bow and the punch is long one. You combine that and to get you what we call compound timing. One stance change, still the same, neutral to forward, but now you're striking twice with the chop and the punch. And it just goes on and on and on from there if you're analyzing and looking at your rules and principles of motion. And so when we're looking at this as the student, and I'll open this up in a second, we come in there, we're being taught principles of motion, we're being taught correct motion, hopefully, if the instructor knows what he's doing. So we're learning to train our body, and Bob White would understand this, muscle memory from golf swings. We're always trying to replicate that correctly. So we can get a hole in one, right, Mr. White? <laughs> to get a get a hole in one like he had. For a while. Today. Right, sir? <laughs> How do I do that again? Right? <laughs> Chip it in for that burden, too. So anyway, <laughs> so we're having this going on. That's it. Okay, so I'm there. I'm the stu I got a question for you, Mr. Planis. Why would we want to learn something incorrect in Kempo? And some of the forms have that. Why? Well, like I tell people, you're not learning it. You you taught the rules and two and two is four, and then you get a, a test. Two and two is five. Wrong, wrong. I learned and I know why two and two is. See, we we don't only show you what to do. We show you what not to do. We teach you these rules and principles, and then we show you something to break it. Everybody I've ever talked to has taken true and false tests in school. You know, this is right, right? No, you know, it's not. So it's just like a test on your learning to see if you did that. We, I've seen the old man do that many times, teach a rule or principle, and then show a technique right behind it, breaks it, and nobody ever questions it. 
Nobody questions it. You know, it's amazing. Well, then, well, let's look at a couple. You just said, obviously, form five, the opening move. And then we have the Holy Grail, which is form six. And I, I hate to say, let's talk about the footwork in six. Why do we teach the opening move if it's not the correct? Yeah, talk about the technique. And I'm going to open that up. Go ahead, answer anybody. Talk about glancing salute. Why you don't step back and a lot of people step off at an angle like you do in the actual technique, but the form, it should be different. Glancing salute. In six, you open up. You mean lamps. glancing lamps. I mean glancing lamps. I'm sorry. I've only had, I've only had two hours sleep. Forgive me. <laughs> Excuses. At least we started with the right form, six. We just did the right first technique. Mr. Planus, I'm going to go this around. Let's go around. Okay. Mr. Planus, why do we teach it that way in the opening? Teach, teach what? Lancing Lance. Why do we step teach to what, six? What, if, that's, if you, we know that's not the correct six? move. Well, it's always step to six. And uh, for 40, 50 years or whatever, it's always been six. In fact, somebody put a clip of, that we, we did a seminar in uh, at the Santa Rita Hotel in Tucson for uh, Gilbert Velez a long time ago, the first form seminar. And somebody put a clip of that on on uh, line the other day to show the old man doing the first move, stepping back to six. Uh, he did a couple of other things that nobody questioned, uh, but it's easy to catch. It, uh, I'm not going to say anything about that, but it's always been the sixth because what it is, it's two techniques. Many techniques, um, Yeoman had a saying, many answers lie in a single move. Okay, how many ways or situations can you use this technique in? You know, in family groupings, like, you know, thrusting salute is one of the biggest families, and that's the first technique is thrusting salute for a knife, which is an inside technique. So you step back to six and you go inside. The second technique is for a low knife. That's also what I forgot. It's a high knife and then a low knife. There's two techniques put together. You can change it yourself, or if just a low knife comes in, you just do leaping crane because that's what it is. It's leaping crane for a knife, and the first one is thrusting salute for a knife. So you put, the, put them together to show that figure eight in the counterclockwise and clockwise motion, that you can't go any other way. If it was a high knife, you couldn't go counterclockwise. You have to go clockwise. And if it's a low knife, you can't go counterclockwise. Or clockwise, you have to go counterclockwise. That's just a figure eight. If you look at a figure eight, you know, it goes this way. And then you turn it this way, it's down and up, down and up. And this way, clockwise, and this, you know, you just look at that mode and figure eight's one of the most used patterns in the system. Well, you yeah, the only difference in thrusting different. salute, you're being attacked with a, with a kick. With a glancing lance, you're being attacked with a knife. You might survive the kick, but if the knife goes into your belly because you haven't moved yourself out of the way, you might not survive that. So why teach stepping back to six o'clock and not stepping off like the technique and using the form? Because we see that in form competition. Well, where are you kicking? Kicking to the where groin. He's kicking straight on, on the glance. You're thrusting salute? Yeah. Kick's supposed to go to the groin. Right. When you angle to 730 and get two outside techniques, his leg hides the groin. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about on 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 for, on glancing lance. That's what I'm talking about. The first technique, right? Yes. In the yes. form we step back to six. Yes. Okay. Six o'clock. Yes. But a lot of people don't. And nobody can pinpoint where that came from. Nobody can put the blame on anybody. Like, who did that? Because it wasn't that way before. For many, many, many years. So and somebody incorporated that in the form? Is that what you're saying? Do what? It was incorporated in the form, and that's why it ended up that way? Well, it was always been 6 o'clock. And then you go outside for the leaping crane. One okay. inside technique, one outside technique. And other changes are made now in the book. I don't know where it came from, but bowing to Buddha is for a roundhouse kick. I said, what? Never, ever was it for a roundhouse. Tell me a technique that we do in our system, that a round motion coming in or from the side, that we don't set a bracing angle into that to have a brace to stop it. If you stay six, you get knocked ass over tea kettle, as they say, you know, and I've done right. that to people who show them that. And then I also show them why defensive cross and bowing to boot are just that figure eight reverse of each other. 
exactly the, the difference. You know, when you're, when you're going uh, uh, defensive cross, you go the X block, clear, and then down, down, up, down, down, up. Then you get down to the lower side, you go block and clear, up, up, down, all both for a front kick. You know, it's always been that way and taught that way, but not anymore. Todd Turgan, thoughts. Mr. Durgan, thoughts. What do you, what do you want me to that. say? Huh? Well, I'm asking you, your thoughts. You have no thought? You can say it on uh, that? Yeah, I, I – uh, so are you saying, Mr. Planis, that, that you teach six for a high thrust on glancing lance or a low thrust? It's two nights. A high and a low put together. Understood. If he comes so, in with a high knife, you do thrusting salute. If he comes right, in with okay. a low knife, you do a leaping crank. Clockwise okay. and counterclockwise on your motion, but you can blend them together. Okay. Two okay. Techniques. So, so, so that being said, if we look at the if we look at the proper plane of action for the block or the deflection of initial high knife, it should be on a number seven plane, which which does the job that it should for a reverse step through, or if you're stepping straight back to six o'clock, as that form is taught initially, then you can move into your low knife attack into leaping crane so on and so forth as he's talking about. The fact that this form is taught to six o'clock tells me that it's, it, uh, it prompts an individual to further study the hand motion that should be coupled with that footwork as opposed to just looking at the footwork itself. So these two things are, it's imperative that they work together. The number seven plane uh, of action with the redirection into the break of the knife because it's a high thrust as opposed to the leaping crane or uh, thrusting lance motion in, uh, on the low end. Leaping crane is a low knife. Yeah. Uh, let's bring in a couple of people uh, that haven't spoken yet. Uh, very interesting, and their both name is Hibbit. So I wanted <laughs> I wanted to wait till you were finished eating there, Derek. Sorry. Why don't you say hello to everybody? And your brother Wes is here. Hello, uh, Wes. Hi, everybody. Nothing from you? You don't want to say anything at all to anybody? What the heck's going on with you, buddy? I'm unmuting you. Unmute. That's Jump in. Okay, Hibben boys. You guys are knife makers. Hello, everybody. The form, we're, we've just discussing form six. Your thoughts? Um, well, if I say the wrong thing, Uncle Huck's going to kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> he has to get to you first. <laughs> so, Wes, you go first. <laughs> oh, brotherly love. No, okay, great. I'm, I'm not going to go first on that. Yeah, I'll, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I, I spent I spent my quarantine time learning six from Huck's video, so I'm still um, dialing six in right now. So I'll, I'll be quiet on it. Why are we so obsessed with six, uh, Derek? Uh, I think it's probably other than four, especially in the tournament circuit, and has – it's just – in our system, I think it's looked at as one of the most – more flashy um, – forms that we have that's why so many people choose to use it in competition um i've seen it in so many tournaments so many people do it and as anybody who's ever been on a testing panel or at any of the internationals or anything or open tournaments uh it's the most most used form that in in competition that i've seen um very few people will do i mean and black belt division, that is. Uh, I think it's also, I think it's also in part because for a while it was seen as the last form in the system. And so people thought that that would be impressive to use the highest form taught, right? Do you have issues with this, Mr. White? Do you teach form six? Uh, yeah, I, I teach it and have for a while. Uh, Personally, it's not my favorite form. Uh, Why is that? I say this often. I think there's holes in the technique that would result in holes in me. There's a lot of the techniques that uh, 
I've gone over with people that are really confident knife fighters and they, uh, they don't really uh, give you too much confidence in the ability to make them work. Now, maybe somebody else could make them work and they're quite comfortable. Uh, just a lot of what I would consider um, mistakes. You know, so, as you know, some of my students are police officers, special forces. They talk about some of the gun techniques. It's just things you wouldn't do. And it would just, it kind of defies logic to encourage my students to do things that are contrary to something that could result in injury for them. I'm going to, I'm going to go over to Chuck Sullivan. Chuck, tell us your rule about knives. Run, run, and don't look back. Run, keep running. No, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him. Uh, we have no knife technique in our system because I don't want to give anybody the illusion that they can win against a knife. I'll tell you what ploy I would probably use if I was confronted with a knife. Somebody springs a knife on me, I'm going to bring out mine, and I'm going to say, now, we're both going to get cut and we're both going to get stabbed. Do you really want to do this? And if the answer is yes, I guess it's not. If, it's, uh, if, it's, if the person is thinking, I'm out of there. No, seriously, uh, knives are, we, we did years and years ago, yeah, a lot of years ago, I'm talking like over 50. We took a, a beginner and put a martial lot in his hand. And we had on white geese we were getting ready to throw out anyway. And we, we just went and let him, tried to disarm him, and we all got slashed, we all got cut, we all got stabbed. And we were black belts, and he was a beginner, a white, I mean, less than a white belt, really. And it was like, from that time on, it was like, I'm sorry, folks. You see a knife? Get the hell out of there. Fast as you can. That's Robert Ashmore. Robert, Cross are you trainer. familiar with Form 6? Cross uh, vaguely, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I've been doing it for you're, a while. Obviously, you're familiar with uh, the green belt techniques that deal yeah. with 6. Right. Well, I, I know the recap on it that I did an evaluation on it. I think there's glancing lance. <laughs> unfurling crane really is unfurling lance. Maybe it's called unfurling crane in it. Thrusting lance, reining lance, entwine lance. Are you familiar with those techniques? Yes, sir. Okay, what's the purpose of us when we deal with knives? Um, what's the purpose? Yeah, um, what's the purpose? What are we dealing with? Uh, basically, it's just to survive. But I was always taught, no matter what the um, weapon of interest or choice is, there's basically uh, deviate, deflect, seize, control, disarm. Thank um, you. And that's within all those techniques. But I do have, you know, after years of learning and watching other people that are proficient with knives, um, it, it's, uh, it's basically survival. And I like Mr. Sullivan's answer, run. I see. Uh, Jason Farnsworth. Yes, sir. Uh, do, you, do, do you practice or do you perform uh, a Form 6? Do you actually train to perform? Absolutely. Okay, yes, what are your thoughts on that form? Uh, the hardest uh, problem that I have is the continued continuity of flow. Uh, I've had many lessons with Mr. Plainness on this and trying to keep the, uh, the, the flow of the technique uh, slow, steady, precise, uh, and, and just keeping that uh, flow. The unending uh, flow of motion is, is the toughest uh, battle, I believe, that uh, people have with that form, especially myself. Is that the biggest problem that you see with people? They just continually stop? Well, I believe that everybody has just like uh, lineage to lineage, instructor to instructor, or interpretation to interpretation. I believe that, uh, you know, a lot of people have their own thoughts on it, just like we talked about earlier. Uh, and I believe some try to go a little too fast, some maybe too slow, uh, stop action. Uh, I don't try to do that. I always try to keep my forms as, as slow as possible, but uh, keeping the, the body moving, especially in six. And it's really tough to do, uh, to keep that going. It really is. Joseph. I want to talk about glancing lance. Okay. And when I asked Mr. Potter about this technique, he was at Terry Robinson's Beverly Hills uh, Health Club. He was teaching a class there. And there was a former military man there who was watching class. And um, you have to realize it was the 1950s. 
films such as Red Without a Cost and West Side Story were popular. And Mr. White, Mr. Planis, and Mr. Sullivan will all remember the act of like something of Spartacus where they take a leather jacket and wrap it around their left arm and hold the knife in their right hand to block against being stabbed as they stab someone. Because they were boxers, they would use their right hand to stab. So this gentleman squared off with Mr. Park and he had one of these, a metal rat tail comb. And his arm up, went to the park and Mr. Parker ran down and he came up with a move from raining a uh, glancing less, stepped off the 45 because he was in a boxing stance, his groin was wide open. And Mr. Parker put his foot square into his crotch, picked the guy up and dropped like a bad habit. As the man was laying and clutching his crotch with the dumb home beside him, he pointed at Mr. Parker and that's dirty fighting. <laughs> Mr. Park looked down and said, I'm sorry, were you going to sterilize that knife before you stuck me with it? <laughs> Chuck Sullivan was was the was the two man set a form created by you and Ed Parker, or was it somebody else? No, no, I, I don't know uh, if anybody else was involved, but Ed Parker taught it to me. And um, uh, then we taught it to, you know, to everybody. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know where he got it from. If somebody taught it to him, if he created it, himself, I really don't know. All I know is that he taught it to me, and then we just taught it. One of the best versions I've seen of it that really is realistic, besides your version in like 62, black and white, which is the standard. One thing that I think Huck will agree with, Knatzer will agree with, Bob White will agree with, is the stances are amazing, first of all. The deep, they, were, they were correct, foot pattern, everything was nice. Today, we're getting sloppy. We're all standing upward. But one of the best versions I've seen live of it that looks so effective is when Todd Durgan and A.C. Rainey have done the two-man set. They do it slow first, and then they go like gangbusters. And I got to tell you, Todd, when you and, and AC do that, it looks real. It looks like we're watching comedy. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see it. Any thoughts there, Todd? No? Just a thank you is appreciated. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was trying to get my audio to work. Yeah, thank you, first of all, for that. Um, so I do have to say, though, that Mr. Rainey teaches us a uh, variation of uh, the traditional two-man set. If you look through the red book, uh, uh, Chinese Karate, Secrets of Chinese Karate, they, it's, and yes, I said Karate, Mr. Sullivan. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the traditional original version of that two-man set is just slightly different than the variant that we do, but um, I have always appreciated the the version that mr rainey taught me uh so many years ago and have always loved doing it with him is that considered a form or is it considered a set well uh, tomatoes tomatoes i'm asking i just want to find uh, out the yeah. yeah i mean it's called a set but i mean you know by definition um it is a set because you're working on you know a list of things uh, but then again, people on the room here would probably disagree with me. Uh, but I, I think you know, what is what it, what defines a set versus a form? Yeah, that's right. a good question, uh, Dennis. What's your Sorry. answer? And then we'll go to Richard. Huck, you got it. If Dennis doesn't answer it, what is the What's answer? The go ahead, Huck. The difference? <laughs> yes, sir. The difference between a set and a form? The spelling. When you're putting moves together, you know, and moving around, you know, I don't care what you call it, it's a form or a set. Yeah. You say the, the forms are numbered and the sets aren't, but some of them are now. Uh, I teach a two man set, and I'm uh, pretty sure, I don't remember exactly, but 
I'm pretty sure the old man told me that came from Chow. Uh, the value, I teach it because the value I see and it has most of our transitions, you know, your crossovers, your angle changes, the foot maneuvers, uh, zoning, and the whole idea of any two-man set or form is to have a real target to focus on. You know, when you work in the air, we say you do everything when and where you want to. And I show that to people all the time. I say, step back and throw a punch. So they do. And I say, oh, tell me, why did you punch where you did? Why did you put that punch lower? Why did you put that high or why middle? Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I know because you wanted to. You do everything in the air when and where you want to. When you have a real opponent, that makes you do it where he moved and gives you a, an actual target to focus on. So when you do your transitions, you say, okay, that's why you do it unblocked first to see if you're in range with focus and penetration that you could have put that shot in because if you out distance yourself, I see many people do that in the first move. They step back and they punch and there's six inches of air between their punch and the person. And they think they're doing the two minutes. And no, they out distance themselves. Kids do that all the time. You know, and I don't let my students out distance themselves. I say focus and penetration is what you're learning. So when you move, you gotta be in position to have that. And that's the value that the set has for me. What are the mis biggest mistakes, Huck, with, with the forms? Biggest mistake with the form? The biggest mistakes, common mistakes that we see. And I'm not saying because of personalization. I'm saying what are the common uh, mistakes we see? Not learning, not learning how to move. I mean, many people are arms only. They, they look like a stone statue with live arms on them and they cannot generate any power. I've, I've done that with many people, walk up to a heavyweight and I say, hit me with that and give it all you got, put me in the hospital, but you got to move just like that, you know, and, it's, and they do and everybody laughs. You know, it's, it's, you know just like uh, two, I was doing a seminar on this in, in, in the back east somewhere and we're doing long two and put the spear hand in, you know, from the end of five swords, you know, the last move which is a category of completion move for, from long one. I'm not going to explain that, but anyway, uh, I asked people, I said, is there anybody here who thinks they can use that effectively? Two hands went up, a big moose and a little guy. I always pick on the moose. And I said, Mr. Moose, I call him the big guy, Mr. Moose. Mr. Moose, come up here. Do yourself and all of us a favor. I said, I'm going to stand here. I want you to put me in the hospital with that spear hand. He said, oh, no, you're going to do something. I said, I promise you, you can have somebody hold me, tie me up. I will not do a thing, but give it to me. So he gave it to me, and everybody laughed. And I said, no, come on, guys, give him a chance. Come on, you got more than that, don't you? Come on, give it to me. Put me now. He hits me again, maybe a little harder than it, but it's basically the same. And everybody laughs again. And I said, okay. Now, what happened? I said, why did you believe you could hurt somebody with that? Because your instructor told you that's a deadly killing move and don't do it to anybody, you'll kill them? You should know yourself what you can and can't do with that. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's amazing what people do and have blind faith in their instructor and whatever, you know, that thinks he could do that, you know. But, you know, if you worked on the, on the gravel and the rocks and then I used to go to you know, Mark Huey School and all that and see the guys doing that, you know, they could maybe use it. And I always talk about that, that movie, uh, You Only Live Twice, James Bond movie, old Sean Connery, when we're shows him working out in Japan and they're throwing watermelons up there, putting a spear hand through them. And you can actually see that. You know? And I said, no, I would not let that man spear hand me. He'd kill me. You know, but you can't do that. You yeah. can't do that. So why are you doing that? You know, I thought about changing that spear hand to a punch, but I said, no, I know why it's in there. It's a traditional reminder. Look, folks, can you use this or not? If you can't, you're pissed in the wind. You know, you, you're, you can't do it. You know, what are you doing it for? You're practicing something you're never going to use or can't use. That's why five swords taught with a punch and not that spear hand. But traditionally, it was a spear hand. So Mr. Just, White, Mr. White, what are the problems you see when you're evaluating a student's form? Well, I think <clears throat> Richard kind of hit it on the head. The idea of people not using their core to get power. They're just going so fast. It's all about speed and not about body mechanics. I always teach the form or like the recipe, but what makes the recipe work is the ingredients and the ingredients are stance transitions. 
And when that's done properly, that's when the forearm looks a lot better. And it's better practice. Do we equate speed? I'm going to use that word loosely because speed can be five miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, or 100 miles an hour. It all relates to the same. Do we equate fast as good? Fast as good. Anyone. I'll open that up to anybody. Well, I certainly enjoy guys. If they're only relying on speed, those are the guys that you would want to fight against because timing coupled with speed obviously is going to be more effective backup mass and that's really what the forms are for to form habits that will complement your art and help you become a better martial artist you practice so like the properly the chances are that's how you'll execute okay let's go right over down here chuck how does one generate the proper speed in a form oh boy uh if you go too fast in a form, you start rounding things off. You start leaving things out. Uh, speed in a form is not a good idea, really. Uh, power and, and getting the uh, showing all the moves is is much much more important to me. But you were talking about uh, about uh, speed related to power. I give you an example. We used to tank. We used to hang uh, a board, one inch pine, and if you hit it with a punch. You can, you can hit as hard, put all your shoulder, your, your rotational force setting into it. But if you hit it without the speed, the board's just going to move away. But Because there's no backup. There's, no, there's nothing to back up the, uh, the, the target. But if you hit that with a real fast back fist, you'll crack it in half. So speed is part of the element of power. Just part of it. There's obviously there's rotational force. There's channeling. There's uh, backup mass. There's mass in motion. There's all these things that, that relate to speed as well. I mean, I'm sorry, the power as well, but speed is certainly uh, one of the elements. Dennis can answer. How do we what? generate the power or is it the speed? Well, or obviously those are all elements. The, 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 the foundational things, that there's two, the two most important basics are stance and transitions. You know, but, you know, rotation is, is obviously there and, and <laughs> anatomical alignment is imperative you know and people have said this and talked to said of different terms but you've got to have proper body body motion you have to have all the pieces working together uh, I, I use the equation that i the concept that i pulled out which is called a watch concept and it's like a, a swiss watch with x number of gears inside if one of those gears has a burr on it the watch does not work correctly so all the elements of the body need to function you know, together cohesively, otherwise you, you, you're not gonna function very well. And if you don't have proper body mechanics, you don't get proper power or speed, you know? And so you have to have all those elements together to get it. And, and of course, you have to focus your, your strike, whatever that may be. So, you know, focusing all that and having all those things work in, in concomitantly together is, 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 is very important. Uh, let's go to Armin. Armin. What are you focusing in when you're doing your form so you have the proper power and speed? My, my problem is flow and timing. So those are two major problems. So I look at six to me is the pinnacle in Kempo forms of flow and timing. And my, I think I've heard this repeated by Huck and others in different contexts. When you're learning something, speed kills. So if you don't have the right form, I, I was always taught speed and power come from good form and repetition. And really, to me, if, that's, if you want to develop speed and power, focus on the basics and focus on your form, slow it down, and, go, and try to relax as you're moving through it. Because relaxation... To me, the key to get generating power is relaxation. If you don't have the relaxation, people are always tensing up. And when you tense up, you just don't get enough power out of it. I think we have two points we want to talk about. We're confusing speed with the word tempo. In the, the tempo is a very musical system. Uh, I know that Huck can understand that as a musician. I know Dennis understands that. I know Mr. White understands that. Tempo, tempo 
if we break it down into music, there are four beats to a measure, four measures, and you take it on and on, and then you have your sequence. Tempo, it relates to the process of how fast we go in the notes. If you're going at 68 beats per second versus 142 beats per second. Uh, we can get in our vehicle. We can go five miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, or 100 miles an hour. We confuse the word tempo and speed. Now, speed is something that's relative to, we use a lot of times in equating, he's going fast, where there's a consistency. It's just a term to define different um, action that is moving at a certain tempo. That's the bottom line. So are we going too fast with our tempo when we perform these forms, Mr. Planis? A lot of people do. I relate this to uh, a lot of instructors say faster, 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 faster. No, slower, slower, slower. You know, I say, you know what Tai Chi is. What's the simplest definition you can give to Tai Chi? I ask my students. I say, it's just Kung Fu done in slow motion. Why do they do it in slow motion? To pay attention to their posture, their timing, their body mechanics and everything else. You can tell where your flaws are and where you're off if you're going super, super slow. I have a, a printout that I took out of a shooting magazine years ago. I changed one word in the article, one word and I highlighted that and I, I printed it out and I pass it out a lot, a lot of seminars and stuff I do called the value of practicing in slow motion. And it tells what all this does. But I, I again, I can relate it to a quick draw contest. Every, there's quick draw that just goes draw and bang and, you're, and the sound of your gun stops a timer. The guy can't hit nothing. He can't even hit the fence or the barn. If you have speed, power and accuracy, accuracy is the thing, hit the target. So when the people draw and shoot, you know, live ammo, let's say you could have a, a match with 10 people in it. You could have a match with 500 people in it. The difference between first place and last place is measured in thousands of a second because everybody has gotten rid of all their extra nonsense motion and went to pure economy motion, you know, to get the job done. Everybody's drawing the same Colt 45, drawing it, cocking it with their thumb and pointing it and aiming it and pulling the trigger. But some can do it a hell of a lot faster than another person. You know, and Bill Jordan, the old border patrol man wrote an article on that, a book rather, it's called No Second Place Winner. You know, like that movie, Quick and the Dead, you know, when they're doing it for real, you know. But everybody's got to do the same thing. But somebody is always faster. And, you know, I saw a movie about that the other day. Who can do it fast? You've got to do it fast enough to beat the opponent. But people try to go too fast. And they don't worry about their timing and their, say, body mechanics and their power principles. And it won't hurt a fly. You know, that has to be there. I have, um, I think, uh, when I'll use me as an example. I've been in the entertainment world almost all my life. I've done lots of musical recordings in a studio where you can actually see or actually you'll hear all your flaws and you'll understand what we're talking about in tempo. I think the key is when I would listen to a song in its arrangement, I would ask the producer, what is my feel? What is my motivation on? Is it a ballad? Is it a rock song or something like that? Now, if you're going to yell at a woman on a ballad, you're pretty much not going to get what you think you're going to get. Take your time, whisper to her, okay? We look at our forms and we need to sort of evaluate what is the purpose of that form, okay? Is it down and dirty, simple, like short one? Or is it continuous flowing of motion like Tai Chi on uh, form six? You know, it is, was the purpose of it to go fast? Are we trying to impress somebody? No. And the number one thing that I always found when I was in the studio was the last note. So when I would watch somebody execute a form, the problem I'd have is, uh, is simply is that that last note. So the technique would happen and they would not finish the last note. Instead, they were worrying more about transitioning to the next technique and not completing it efficiently. Thoughts on that? Let's go right across the board here. Let's talk to a few people on that. Jason Farnsworth, tell us your thoughts, sir. Uh, I go back to the same thing about taking the uh, form slow. Uh, it's the only way you can do them, in my opinion. 
uh, oftentimes, especially in six, since we're actually talking six, uh, as I mentioned previous, uh, I'm not sure where uh, oftentimes I've seen people do more hard style form uh, versus a more uh, slower uh, kung fu type of uh, of a form. I'm not sure again that changes from from person to person or studio to studio, but uh, I believe that it's really difficult to continue that that flow, and it it really needs to be. Uh, but it have to slow down on on all the forms, whether it be short one or six. Um, let's go to Liam. Liam. Is your tempo consistent on your forms? Um, well, yeah, I'm a musician as well uh, all my life, so um, I have a different way of looking on forms. So when I, if I teach a form, I might teach it one, two, three, four. I know that's not a good tempo style, but if we were to teach music, we need to fill them gaps. So when we're talking about the gaps in, in music or, and tempo, we change the word, and so we say something like one that in there too. So you're filling them little gaps. So when I'm teaching a student, I'm teaching one, two, but then eventually I'm teaching the rhythmic version of it, which is one that in that. So when you're teaching the rhythmic version of it, they tend to get it a bit faster. So, so you're filling them little gaps. So the you know, is it's interesting you say that uh, in the gaps. I worked with B.B. Um, King, and in talking to him, I said, uh, how do you approach a song? He says, well, it's like a conversation. You don't yell at them all the time. And sometimes it's the space between the notes, space between the notes. So you could sit here with Mr. Planis and you'll be a, a, evaluating a form. For some reason, we've gotten into this habit that if we're doing all this business all over the place, sorry to do that guys, but you're seeing that. And it's like, why are you doing that? Because you think it's more impressive? Um, we have a term called economy of motion. There's a purpose for every move. Don't add, which does not to be there, but you can actually put a space between a move and it will give you more emphasis. The great example of that was my teacher, Frank Trejo. He was never a trained musician, never a trained dancer, but boy, oh boy, that guy had rhythm. So he could put together something and tell a story. So when you're looking at it, Shane, I haven't talked to you all day. I'm now coming to you. Shane's going to, I love Shane. He's going to come up with something great. Shane, unmute yourself, sir. You there? And we unmute it. Good. Okay, Shane. Hello, Shane. Welcome to our discussion. When you're, when you're executing or training with your forms, what do you try to do to keep it consistent? Uh, my biggest focus here lately is just making sure every one of my hand positions has a proper foot position. And that's what I've been focusing on here lately. Okay. I, do you ever find yourself starting out with one tempo? Pretty much pretty, I would say fast. And by the time you got at the end of the form, you're also like a panting dog because you're going too fast. I don't, I don't, I used to be, I used to do that. You used to, okay. <laughs> I think I can get through it pretty steadily right now without uh, doing that and uh, starting either fast and then ending slow or starting slow and ending fast. I think my tempo is pretty smooth throughout the whole thing uh, right now. Okay. Uh, go to uh, one of my favorite, Mr. Five. Mr. Five, Zach Carter. Oh, my God. Okay, tell us about five. Yes, sir. Let's talk about five. I know Huck wants to hear what you have to say about form five, so please tell us. He's all ears. As I was told, the uh, counterbalance form, as uh, I had a lesson uh, on the phone with Huck about that, and just that general statement uh, enlightened me a lot about that form and in reviewing it. But one of the things that I always see with that form that I try not to to do personally and it's always a work in progress is is make sure to hit all those proper stances uh, uh you should be performing to a mirror image of yourself as i was always taught so a lot of time people are striking the groin or, or doing things and they're doing it way high where the groin wouldn't be so that's one of the things that i try to do with my forms is uh uh, proper stances and using myself as a mirror image and not bobbing up and down 
uh, like you do. So keeping continuity with that and keeping continuity with the speed that I start the form with that I finish it. And I do that as I was taught by starting to learn the forms very slow and then trying to move them a little faster and then finding that happy medium in the ground somewhere to where uh, if I do it, you know, uh, in competition and forth. Jason, you like to do form five, correct? I do, yes. Yes, you do. So you and Zach have something in common. Okay. What's the biggest difficulty in Form 5? And remember, Mr. Planis is listening. <laughs> well, what I find with 5 is what you were mentioning uh, to Shane about um, their tempo with the actual form itself. It is extremely difficult to start the form and finish 5 with with not running out of breath and not wanting to you know keel over on the floor if, if you're competing with it uh if you will um the the up and down motion is as uh uh he was saying a moment ago of uh, the bobbing of the head uh is is a consistent thing with the actual form itself because of all the counterbalance the dropping in the stances and back up and and the takedowns and and whatnot but um I brought uh, another new uh, uh, version out of myself within five when I competed with it last year, as we talked about the last time uh, we were on. And I chose five specifically because uh, it was one form for me that was lagging behind and all the rest. And it forced me to work on that form and it forced me to make it what everybody had seen if they had seen that video uh from last year at that taping uh i have a good i had a good time with it uh but it's extremely taxing on the body to begin and end the same way there's lots of man hours that has to be put into that form to make it correct you know funny is that when as zach and i were reviewing five and going through it yes, i thought one of the hardest things the transition only because we're older now is um circling the horizon with the takedown and then yes. back up doing right. that twice and then going into leaping crane mr planis why was that in why was that inserted with the takedown was it just because of the form or circling the horizon and leaping crane move? <laughs> circling the horizon and leaping crane yeah well circling the, the horizon with the takedown and then you okay. down uh, that's a, that's a category completion move but before, don't, 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 I don't want to get sidetracked, so keep me where I am. I don't want to go back to Zach when he told me it was a, a counterbalance form five. And that's this middle part. The first part is backup mass and, and merge with gravity. Then the first counterbalance form or technique is hopping free, and that's where it changes to counterbalance. So you mm. just might have missed some of that. I don't know. But anyway, uh, surfing the horizon and leaping crane are back to back as they invert the strike pattern. When you do leaping crane, you go low, middle, high, leg, kidney, head. Then you, you drop the opponent on his knee. On certain horizon, you drop you on your knee. So you go high, middle, low. Okay? So you invert the strike pattern. That's why they're back to back. Most techniques in the forms that are back to back have some kind of relationship with each other and point things like that out. Like I did earlier with the defensive cross and bowing to Buddha. Uh, they just invert the strike pattern. like. Again, like uh, crashing wings and crushing hammer. Tell me something. I, I, you know, I know it's in the form, and I'm guessing it is part of the backbreaker. But hopping crane was that just an extension of how? Where did that come about? Because that is probably the only place I've ever seen it. And I grew up on 32 techniques for bell hopping, hopping crane. Yes, sir. Okay, hopping crane is not in the uh, list of techniques. It's the that. principle that's just teaching you how to gauge. Uh, everybody's played kick the can, kick the stick when they were kids. Okay, so you put the stick out on uh, on uh, a couple of beer cans or whatever, and you get back, and you don't measure the distance, nothing, and you run up there and kick it. But you have to make a little hop to position yourself. And this is what the football players do now when they put the ball on the tee. You watch them, how they measure their stance back and then off angle. So when they get there, they're in the right position to kick that ball. They don't have to make any adjustments. See, so the person in five that you're doing hopping crane on is the one you did uh, dance of death on, and he happens to be getting up, but you're back away from him. So you come back onto his line, and you make this hop to adjust your distance for the sweep kick. And it's, it's the same as uh, back, uh, 
uh, dense or dense was, but you're one zone lower. Instead of above the arm, you're below the arm. But the whole hop, and it's just to gauge distance. You're learning how to gauge distance. That's what you're hopping on your crane to gauge distance for your sweep kick. I enjoy Phi because it, it really is one of those forms where we get to explore wide kneel and closed kneel. You know, those lower stances that we rarely see because inevitably I watch a lot of martial artists and especially Kempos and we become so lazy with our lower body, with our, our proper knee, uh, the knees being bent, alignment. They, they just don't want to bend over. They don't want to do that. Right, Mr. Rabello, are you still here with us? Oh, you bet. Yeah, and you sound good. Well, I, I find the that, Joseph, what yeah, the hell is wrong with five? Maybe. We should be practicing five. Come on, talk to me about it. Wrong with five. I, I'll tell you. With, with, a, with a knee and hernia right now, trying to do five is not a cakewalk by any stretch of the imagination. I, I, I was melting as, as, as Huck was saying it. Tai Chi is nothing more than Kung Fu does slowly. To really appreciate the be of five, you got to be slow. You've got to, you've got, as, as Barkley, you've got to pronounce each movement. Don't mumble emotion. And it's really, you know, it's really what's the true beauty of form. I can't move quickly to a knee position and back up. So I have to take slow. I have to knee, I have to pronounce, I have to extend the leg back, I have to return to my kneeling position, and I got to do it a little slower. And, and re that really becomes the beauty of what you were talking about earlier with tempo and time. You know, a lot of times we're so busy, preoccupied with speed, or preoccupied with flow that we forget of the beauty right. timing. When, you know, I said when you mentioned about um, the story with BB King, I remember Mr. Mm -hmm. saying, it's the space between notes makes for good music. And that, that memory popped right in again. Okay, so let's so move that's on the, the table here and let's talk about a few things. I'm gonna come back to one of the things that is common to all the forms, and that'll be a way I close tonight. But being the interim, I'm gonna go with this. Right off the back, Armin, what is your favorite form? What is what form is the one you hate to do? I don't hate, I don't hate to do any, but my favorite would have to be four. Form four. Why is that? Kicks and punches. Kicks and punches. Really? Okay, I'm going to ask how to explain, to explain that in a few seconds. I know he has some points on that. Liam, favorite form? Uh, I love four, and it's funny the way uh, Mr. Pabst was saying earlier about the Tai Chi. I always, when I'm doing it, I always get in a Tai Chi mode when I'm doing it, and it's the way I try to teach it. So I just love the way it flows. Okay. Uh, and, and on that note, five, five just doesn't work for me. I just don't know about it. As I will admit, maybe I just need more work. I see. You know, when I was in, I was in college, graduate school, I had a, a class in uh, constitutional law, real property. Hated the class. It was like learning Mandarin or something. But I had to find something I had to like about it. Zach Carter, favorite form besides five? <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like short three. Always have. I don't know why. I like four because of uh, the footwork and everything in it. And uh, I like six because uh, you can do it kind of like a Tai Chi form, as I was taught by Mr. Ebrow many years ago. But I like the, the, the flowing motion that's in it. Is that the biggest problem with six? Is that we try to change it? Are we trying to change six to make it more like, say, one of the, the, the beginning forms? Very, you know, staccato. Is that what it is? Is that the problem, Jason? I, I believe it is. I, 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 you can't do it as a hard style form. Uh, Why do we do it then? Why do we see that, sir? Why do we I, see that? Well, I, you know, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I really don't know. Um, again, it could go back to interpretation um, and what people can do, uh, what they're capable of being able to do. But uh, uh, I, I just don't know why that, uh, why it's done as a hard style, uh, a hard, hard stylist type of form, if you will. Yeah, it's funny. In the beginning, we talked to Huck about instructors. Okay. Yes. We have some of the great instructors here. We have some great minds. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Bob White, is it because we misunderstand 
the purpose of the form, what the what what it is what what we're supposed to take from the form, is that the problem? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it certainly is a problem. You know, having a purpose to every movement, including, of course, your stances, including your checks. Um, if you're purpose driven, I think your execution improves dramatically. And again, about speed, uh, Dan and Osanto had a great saying about how most martial artists will mask their inadequacies by going too fast. And a terrible way to practice. But uh, to answer your question on forms, short three and form five. I see. Sir, do you have, uh, you know, here's the thing. You're known for great fighters, champions that walk in to that school and walk out. And they're magnificent fighters when it comes to uh, tournaments and such. Is it because when they're on the mat and you're teaching them how to fight, how to put their hands up, how to block, how to punch, how to kick, there's instant feedback if they don't do it right. Whereas in a form, it's not that. Well, I certainly want the forms to be vehicles that help them improve their fighting. That's why our checks are going to be a lot different traditional checks. I'd like the person, when they do short form two, and they're having their left hand up as a check, I want that to be the exact same check they would do it if they were in a self-defense situation or a tournament. So what you do in practice, you're going to do in the game. And like I said, my job is to develop habits that will bless them. And it's just not tournaments. It's self-defense is always the priority. And if they train hard like athletes uh, in sparring, chances are in a self-defense situation, they're going to be in shape, they're going to be fit, and they're going to have a strategy. Uh, the same thing you would do in a tournament you do in the street. Why don't we train more in the forms? I mean, That's personally it, it, why I like form five. I mean, why, don't, why doesn't the student want to embrace more of the forms? Because if you go back, and I had this conversation with, uh, with uh, Dennis Knatzer, educated me in Infinite Insights, Volume 1, Three Divisions of the Arts, Basics, Self-Defense Techniques, Freestyle. Forms fall into all three. Why not embrace that? Why not? Take that and and work on that when you're not on the mat with somebody else, sir. I'm asking Mr. White. Well, I think we want to. Okay. Yeah, I think we want to and need to. And I'll use uh, Sigun David Labaudi's line. It's not cafeteria kepo. You've got to do all aspects to have the best balanced mm -hmm. education. You know, for, for many years, we were top-heavy and sparring. But you get smarter and you learn more and, and you get to reap the benefit, the knowledge of somebody like Hart Planis, and you, you end up growing. And that's what I really want to do, you know, at our school. I've been teaching for 50 years, but I still want to improve. So if you hear things like I did today, I hear some things that are going to make me a better teacher. That's why I'm listening. So it's a process, but there is not a doubt in my mind the more well-rounded the student is, the better martial artist he is. Todd Durgan, we need forms, correct? Absolutely. I Why think is it then I hear pushback or I read pushback on the Kempel forms, and I'm sorry, I'm going to call it out because it is our art. It is our legacy. We will create future uh, leaders. Leaders don't get to cherry pick this stuff, folks. You got to Got to jump in there. You got to answer these questions. I put some tough questions out there for a few people. But I hear this. It's a common thing. Why are you teaching 80s techniques, but at the same time, that person or those individuals will go and practice or perform or compete with the 60s and 70s forms? Doesn't make sense to me. Can you explain that to me? How's that work? It's because I'm teaching... 2020 principles and concepts. So if we talk about purpose, which we've been talking about and the purpose of forms and door sets, you know, the purpose for a form, if I'm teaching short form one, it depends on whether I'm working with a black belt or a white belt as to whether, as to what my true purpose is. 
for teaching that form and what I want their purpose to be in, in doing it and in practicing that form. They each have a different end game for doing that or for going through it. And so as we go through a form, every move in that form has purpose. Now, some of that purpose is minor moves, major moves, et cetera, et cetera. And if we're not addressing each individual move with the right purpose for the right mo for that moment, uh, for example, if I'm going through uh, Mr. Rebello's uh, Tai Chi Five, okay, uh, the purpose is different than if I'm going through uh, Mr. Farnsworth's Tournament Form Five. Okay, because I, I'm trying to achieve something different. So the purpose changes anyway. So why am I teaching 1980s techniques or forms in 2020? Because they still carry 2020 principles and concepts. So the principles haven't changed. Have not changed. Hopefully they've grown for the individual in understanding and in application. Dennis Knatzer, your thoughts. Oh, by the way, before we go further, Todd, favorite form? <laughs> it depends on what my purpose is. Well, pick one, sir. How I like all of them because they all have a bunch of stuff. But but it's not a form. Technically, it's a set, right? Okay. Two-man set. Mr. Planners, did you hear that? He likes them because yeah. of the stuff. Just want you to Two know. Two-man set. That's okay. right. That's Two -man good. Set. That's good. Right. That's me. Okay. <laughs> Dennis can answer. Favorite form? and thoughts on what we've been talking about? Well, when I was competing, I won a lot with long three. And a lot of people, I don't know, either don't like it, don't want to do it or whatever, but I found a lot of uh, good tournament action in there. My, my next favorite after that was the six. Uh, you know, always look forward to that because I thought it was, was uh, you know, high ranking form. I thought there was a lot of fun stuff in it, you know, as far as tournament goes. Uh, reality is a whole different thing that the form, that the techniques are within uh violate principles all over the place and you have to modify them when you take them to use on the street but mr parker used to say you know to people you know in, in terms of kempo is how much kempo do you know of and everybody knows of a lot the next thing he would say is but actually how much do you actually know and that starts becoming less and then he said how much do you understand and that's even less than what you know of or know. Then finally, how much can you apply? And, you know, the application, you know, gets on exactly what everybody's talking about here. You know, transitions, footwork is, is critical. Is, is footwork is critical. Uh, stance is critical. Uh, you know, and then from there, you've got to be able to put rhythm and timing to everything. And you've got to have proper body alignment and body mechanics. Otherwise, it, it just doesn't function well. Uh, Robert Ashmore. Robert Ashmore. Yes, sir. Yes. Your favorite form? Thoughts? What was you've heard so far? Um, I I tend to gravitate to five. <clears throat> I uh, you like I those like, wide kneels, huh? I love them. No, <laughs> not anymore. That's for sure. And and speaking of which, um, the takedown in Circling Horizon, which was mentioned, um, I. I have a hard time. My knees are shot. If I was to go down and do those takedowns, I, I wouldn't get back up. So well, um, go down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's typically what happens. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed everything that's been said. Um, I, I was thinking about the uh, personal, personalization that started out when we first started talking. And I got to, to wondering, um, personal personalization can come from all of the years of experience that that are in here all the great instructors that are represented in this conference and is it actually personalization or is it become sophistication as long as it has meaning in other words each instructor brings something completely different and as long as it's 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 motion with meaning um you know that's that's a whole other debatable topic but uh, it's pretty fascinating to me and I've just enjoyed the whole thing. And Mr. Knatzer, I'm coming for you. I'm going to get you, sir. <laughs> Let's go over to Wes Hibben. Wes, obviously a student of Huck Planus and your father, Gil Hibben, legendary knife maker. 
Uh, I always loved the story about him at the uh, at the fair throwing the knife and it coming back to visit him. So, but you were just talking about reviewing uh, Huck's uh, video on forms. What's your favorite form and why? I'm enjoying six a lot. I like the way it flows. And I really like the fact that I don't have to drop down on one of my knees. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, that's true. Four and five are murder on your legs. My God. Derek Hibben. Hello, sure. Derek. How you doing, buddy? Doing well. Thank you. Enlighten us with your favorite form or the form you don't like. That's even better. Um, and remember, I always, that's listening. I always enjoyed doing four. I think Uncle Frank really kind of, kind of, instilled that into me i think i watching watching him in footage at tournaments just the way that he moved yeah it just there was something something always just that felt good and felt right about doing four uh like dennis said too i really enjoyed uh doing long three for a long time because it really really made me um focus on really really trying to get my mirror imaging down on both sides um the best that i could and uh with huck listening i'll uh, i'll definitely uh throw in short one uh, <laughs> tell us the story about short one which one <laughs> tell us the one we'd love to hear because huck well, was there well yeah huck, huck was definitely there and uh like I said, I told I told you guys some of you guys this story uh, when I when I got my black belt. Man, I I was I had four down so good. I mean, Uncle Frank signed off on it. My dad signed off on it. Like all these other people, senior, they're like, oh yeah, it, it's good, it's good, it's good. And the first thing Huck said is, "Let's see a short one." And I just went my pale blank. I was like, oh shit, here we go. Uh, we spent an entire an entire day down in my dad's shop um just on doing the salutation correctly just on doing short one correctly and um just so you know huck that we've hidden that shanai so you can't hit me in the legs with it anymore um but uh He's going to teach you the technique for that one. I, I know where it is, Huck. <laughs> yeah, I know where it is. I know where it is, too. But I know where it is. I'll get it for you. Just so you but, know. But, yeah, uh, uh, you know, we all, in all the forms, for me, like, like Mr. Durgan said and everything, they all have a purpose and a meaning and a, and a who, what, when, where, and why. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed doing all of them. Um, there's not one that I'm like, eh, you know, when I first, when I first learned short two, um, I can remember when, it, when I first learned it, I hated it. And it was just because, you know, you do those first move and I'm like, where's the, where's the power in this? Where, where, you know what I mean? And it, at the time and, and at the, at the rank and level of learning, it didn't, you know, realize that, you know, you're not, it's, it's a form. It's not the technique. You know what I mean? Even though it's up to us to put power, speed precision accuracy all those things in, in into the places where they're supposed to be but for me that was the one that i just i hated learning and i hated doing and it took me a long time to get an appreciation for it but um i really i still really enjoyed doing four uh my dad loved four um he enjoyed five and six as well uh but he uh, he always would say that four was one of his favorite ones to do as well I see. Okay, let's let's move on. Uh, I know Chuck Sullivan's got to be uh, the staff set. <laughs> it's got to be because you created it. No. I mean, what, I mean, you know, you honestly, it is very rare, folks, that we get a chance to be with the composer to who elegantly composed and created a piece of Kempo history. So, Chuck, that that I got to remember when I – Steve Aaron – 
Steve Aaron <laughs> taught me. Yeah. The staff set. And he learned all his stuff from Huck Planis. The staff set, creating greatness. Is there anything else other than that that really stands out to you in the early days of the forms and how they were presented? Um, I teach white people short three and, uh, and a staff set and the two man set uh, because I wanted to have something that's traditional tempo, not just IKCA. And, uh, and that, I, I love them all. Uh, and I, I have to say all equally. And, and Huck brought up something earlier and I'm running out of power, by the way. I mean, my phone keeps telling me this, so if I don't get it out loud, he said, accuracy, speed, and power. Thank you, Huck. Uh, I, I love that, that, that the, whole, the whole thing. What it is is I, I teach it as the word ASP, which is the deadliest thing in the world, A-S-P, accuracy, speed, and power. And in that order, accuracy above all. You can blast the guy in the shoulder, and the next day he'll go, damn, that hurt. But you poke him in the eye with one-tenth. One tenth, what you hit him in the shoulder with, he's down and out. Hit him in the throat, hit him in the groin. Power isn't isn't necessarily the best thing that we have. Accuracy, you got to you got to get there. You got to hit the target. If I if I poke you in the cheek, that does nothing. I poke you in the eye, you're gone. Speed, I've got to get there because if you move before I can get to you, then nothing I do is going to be any good. And power is last. And of course, we want as much power as we can get. And we practice for it all the time. But when I, I, I yell at people all the time, ask, 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 accuracy, speed, and power. And that's exactly the same thing I was a for form. You know, it's funny you say that because those were those same concepts, maybe not the same words, were always drilled in, into me uh, in Pasadena. Uh, they would pick up the staff, and I thought, oh, I'm going to learn the staff set or something. No, they used it to make sure my footwork was correct, my stances were correct, my knees were bent. And it seems that I'm seeing less and less of that. So we're talking about that. Uh, Mr. White, how do you address the issue of the salutation? You're teaching the salutation, the Kempo salutation. Yeah, how do I address it? We start it with short form two. Short form one, both sides. We don't do the salutation, but we're talking about the formal. We're talking about the formal. The formal. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand that. I'm sorry. Correct. Not a salute, but the full salutation. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that with the indication of the form we're going to do. The uh, here's the sequence we teach: bow, salutation, the form, salutation, bow. So the first and the last thing that you do is bow. Consistency. You know, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to open this up. Anybody has the history on it, throwing it out. Huck, the salutation, where did it come from? Well, the salutation is two parts. The uh, the original Kung Fu part, which is the first part, and the stepping onto the horse with that part added, supposedly came from Matosi. Uh, And the wording comes from that. But, you know, I just make sure that everybody understand the meaning of it because what you're doing is sign language it's sign language you know you can't slough off in sign language you won't say the say you know what you're trying to say so it's you know i have people say you know we the warrior and the scholar come together and go forth to fight back to back to pull the country back together i have no weapons you know hide my secret and pray for forgiveness if i have to use it you know make sure they say it and it matches the emotion and the timing yeah uh so, so, so what happened to the twist stance from the, in the very beginning from Shaolin or wherever you want to bring it from that nobody yeah. does anymore? Well, I don't know. They don't do it. My people all do it. No, there's lots of, things, lots of things done now that are, you know, aren't done or we've gotten forgotten about whatever. It just, as I say, it's just, who's teaching you? You ask these people where right. this came from. They got no teacher. That's Seems to be no abbreviated. Or lots of instructors, but no teachers. Seems to be very abbreviated these days from what I've seen. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, oh. Jason, explain how you learned the salutation. Uh, pretty much exactly uh, uh, probably what everybody else has been doing. No, uh, no, no. I want to know yours. <laughs> I don't want to know about everybody else's. <laughs> well, I, uh, I've been uh, 
a part of the plainest lineage my entire career, um, more so now within the last uh, 12 or so years, and it's been consistently the same. It has not been different from the two different instructors that I have gone to that's been a part of that. So I, I don't have anything to base it on other than what I've done since the moment I've been in a Kempo studio, because I haven't known anything different. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Dennis Kinatzer. Did Mr. Parker teach the salutation differently to other instructors? Well, I, I, you know, I think as time evolved to the 80s, uh, he did uh, alter briefly or slightly some of the things. Like in the beginning, you know, Mr. Parker, you know, eliminated bows. He said you only bow to inanimates. And so he then created a nod with uh, the first of the form and then you start you know, stepping out. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, he, I, I think he did, as typical Ed Parker, he evolved through different uh, eras with different things. And at the end, he was trying to basically put everything together uh, for video. And so he could uh, actually create a basis, which I wish he would have uh, finished, you know, and there would be a lot less questions today. Uh, if uh, if he would have done that, so he never he never really finished it. But it, there, he he always made minor evolutionary alterations. Chuck, you know when you look at the salutation, how did he teach it to you? Wow, uh, <laughs> we're talking sixty something years ago, Paul. <laughs> well, that's right. Just like yesterday to you. Yeah, right. <laughs> How did he teach it? Uh, I really don't remember how it was taught. I mean, I, I remember, you know, doing it and uh, and so on. Uh, still do, teaching to my people as, uh, as well. I want them to have the traditional salutation as well as our own. Um, but uh, it, again, that was just there when I started and Parker had it. It was already uh, in, in use. And then we all learned it the same way. He, he taught it to us. came up. Um... It was talked to me the way Huck talks about it, with the warrior and the scholar coming together. I find um, this is the common flow right now in Campo. It's sort of, it's just all over the place. We're very focused on this warrior side of us, which is understandable, especially in the circumstances of right now, with all the conflict and the fear of bad things happening because people are losing their mind. So we have to be very vigilant about protecting oneself and be a more uh, observant. Uh, review the eight considerations. Go back to Infant Insights. Look at the first eight considerations. Be aware of that, folks. But you know what? This right here on this platform, we're very lucky to have some superstars. And we have also people that have been there for a long time, and this is their life, and they're going to share it. So the scholar side is withered, okay? We're seeing a Schwarzenegger right hand and a Barney Fife left, and that is sad. And I'm sorry to use that uh, metaphor, but I have to because it's time for us to reach out to our seniors and ask them for direction. So we're grateful to have a Bob White, a Dennis Knatzer, a Huck Planis, Joe Rapello, etc. cetera, that's sitting here that can share with us knowledge because you as bob white just said he came out of this today going boy i just picked up a few more things and he's been in this a long time and he's one of the senior voices that many people listen to so the scholar part folks has to be rekindled we need to revisit this this is a thinking man system um huck when i was taught it that front twist that shoulder turned when you came there I see a lot of people with their shoulders straight and they don't turn. They just move their arms. Why do they do that? I don't know. Ignorance is the anesthesia that deadens the pain is stupid. Uh, it's just, it's just, I don't get it. Pick up the phone, call up Planis, call up Canasser, call up White, you know, and ask them. A lot, people, to see a, lot, a lot of people don't put any real value on that. You know. Then why is training Kempo, sir? Why in the hell are you in Campbell? Go do something else. Go MMA. Go, 
kick out the 80s technique, no, eliminate saying, okay, the that's, arms. That's the salutation. Now let's get into the meat. You know, let's get yes. into the meat. Some I'm people ready. look like, you know, a dancer. I'm not a dancer, you know. Uh, uh, it's, it's what you like to do. Like, uh, you know, in Sistema, Vladimir, you know, the head of Sistema, uh, one of the other, he wanted to try to talk me into getting his, you'd be great in my system. I said, no, Vlad, I can't do that. I cannot move like that. That's not me. I'm not a dancer like, and, and do that kind of stuff, you know, so that's just me, not me. You know. I think the sad the, thing the is that, I'm sorry. The salutation, yeah, the salutation is really very simple, very simple. But why can't people do it? Why don't they do it right? Why don't they do it? If teachers, just like you say, you got to improve the scholar. Where's the scholar? Somebody who studies under who? Got to have a teacher. You know, that's the thing. Teachers are few and far between anymore. Ones that know what they're doing, you know. Uh, when I, as I say, qualified teachers. You know, that's the hard part. Uh, I said many, many years ago, you don't need qualified teachers to babysit. Most of the schools have become babysitting schools, and you don't need a qualified teacher to babysit. You just need somebody a little bit older, and look how long that's been. The old man's been gone for 30 years now or more, you know, and these people have become kids. They've grown up into adults, and they never learned anything, and they never will. Uh, so it just has to go back beyond that. So they're more concerned with money over the minutia of the art. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 agreed. Yes, sir. But it is a business, you know, it is a business. When you put that sign out, you know, I got to pay for it, you know. And the old man did the same thing. The old man did the same thing. He but told me this, many times. Here, here's, a, here's a spot, a response. If you want to study Kempo, an American Kempo, as Ed Parker created, there are great resources at your availability. You can go to a teacher like Huck Planis, go to Mr. Bob White's studio, spend time with Dennis Knatzer. I'm telling you folks that are watching this, if you want to be an American Kempo, quit playing games, go and learn the material. Do not run around and profess that you are something special. Instead, contribute. If you want to know how to do the salutation, Ed Parker's Infinite Insights, Volume 5, Mental and Physical Application. Page 14 and 15 will give you the answer on how to do a salutation. So you don't screw it up. It's come on. I mean, I, I, I know it's like having a, a pair of new shoes and you put on dirty socks. What the hell's wrong with you? You know, come you got, on, man. You know, it's got to be right. This is wrong. I'm calling people out because I have people here that are <laughs> – are spending quality time and they need to. So it's not that I'm trying to attack anybody. I'm just trying to say, start spending time with the scholar, learn from these individuals, ask these questions. If you don't want to come on this forum, that's fine. Watch it, maybe learn something from it and then create your own forum, go zoom, Facebook or whatever. And then share your thoughts. So you have some feedback. But don't just write something and then walk away. That doesn't work. This is not Kempo. Kempo is a thinking man's art. Parker created that. You have greatness in front of you. That's why the Hall of Fame is the celebration of greatness. So with that in mind, I want to thank all of our participants. Amazing. I'm truly honored, Mr. White. You came on. Thank you very much for being part of it. I hope your golf game goes great. <laughs> you got to let us know. Okay, yeah. West Heaven. Thank you. Please say hello to your parents. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you're welcome, sir. Derek Hibben, thank you. It's really always a pleasure. Robert Ashmore, thank, thank you, you for your input. I really appreciate it. And thank stick you, with five. Yes, It'll sir. Happen. Okay. Todd <laughs> Durkin, another level. Boy, on oh boy. If you want to spend some quality time, talk with Todd. He has got some amazing things. And... Look what I have. A All right. 3D version. Nice. Look at that. I need to order one of those. Remember that? <laughs> Maybe you guys don't know that one. We'll go with that. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Dennis, Follow the bouncing so ball. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. I love talking to him. He educates me until I, I get him really upset and then he yells at me. Uh, Dar I already talked to Dar Joe Rebello. Always bring in a nice 
colorful response from the East Coast. Always like that. It's always fun. Shane, thank you. Good to see you. I appreciate it. Jason, you, got, you have yes, great sir. techniques. You have a great mindset. And more importantly, you have access to a great mind that will share with you. Stay with him. Thank you. Carter, thank you. You look very dapper. I'm glad you could stay awake for us. <laughs> Love you. That. Thank you. That's good guy. <laughs> Liam, thank you so much from the other side of the pond. Great person. Armin, thank you, sir. And you don't mind, last but not least, uh, senior Can master. I ask you two arts. quick questions, if you don't mind, Paul? One, sure. one do you have the prior presentations archived by chance and available on the net? They're on YouTube. YouTube, all on YouTube? I did a YouTube search. I couldn't find it. So I, what's the? Uh, Paul Casey Entertainment. Okay, perfect. Something like that. I don't know. They're on That's their YouTube somewhere. And then you go a quick to the KKHOF <laughs> homepage as well. It's on his. It's on the Hall of Fame homepage. Yeah, I always put everything. Here's, I leave all the videos. in Paul Karate Hall of Fame. Yeah, so you can always find it. And we'll archive. And then I'm going to be uploading these things uh, to uh, Anchor so they can be out there. I'm going to try to cut them up into segments so they can be more palatable. You got 10 minutes. You can hear this. If you're driving an hour, you can hear it. But fat, last but not least, I love talking to him. He is an amazing guy. For many years, he, he, he puts up with me. Um, a couple of years ago, we honored him in Las Vegas with a special day. And so a real treasure to Kempo. Uh, Senior Master of the Arts, Richard Huck Planis, thank you so much. I oh, appreciate your input, sir. You're, a, you're just a real treasure. And it's a, it's a nice um, connection to Mr. Parker to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, sir. We're glad yeah. you're safe. One thing I wanted to add, uh, you, you started to get on to the uh, transitions in the forms uh, and you got away from it. But uh, there's a thing about that is all the transitions in the form have a reverse and an opposite. This is, this is food for thought for people. So we can start looking for that and you'll see amaze what you come up with. We will revisit this. This is only part two of a six part series on the art of forms so we'll start getting a little more deeper i just wanted to scratch the surface again we appreciate everyone that's here today i hope you have a beautiful saturday night i look forward to seeing you again on behalf of the kimple karate hall of fame educational video series thank you so much salute